Good evening, everyone. Before we start, I would like, in behalf of the congregation, to present a gift to Pastor Joy and her family for, for I, the words are I'm missing, but for, for our love, to show our love for what she's done this past year. Thank you. Thank you. In the bleak midwinter, frosty wind made moan. Earth stood hard as iron, water like a stone. Snow had fallen, snow on snow, snow on snow. In the bleak midwinter, long ago. Our God, heaven cannot hold him, nor earth sustain. Heaven and earth shall flee away when he comes to reign. But in the bleak midwinter, a stable place sufficed for the Lord God Almighty, Jesus Christ. We gather on this cold winter night, one of the shortest nights of the year. We gather to welcome a baby, a baby who was born thousands of years ago, a baby who will be born yet again, right here in our presence. This baby doesn't demand the best accommodations, doesn't insist we get our houses all cleaned or in order before he arrives. He simply comes, takes up residence among us, and invites us to follow. Whether you are here in person tonight or you join us in virtual community, whether you come tonight with a carefree heart or a heart touched by sorrow, whether you have heard the Christmas story a hundred times, or you are going to hear it for the very first time tonight, know you are welcome. You are welcome to gather around the manger as we tell this story once again. I invite you to breathe deeply, shake off a little of the cold, and open your heart as we listen to our prelude this evening. I invite you to stand as you are able, whether that's in body or in spirit, and we are going to join together in a responsive call to worship that you will find up on the screen. Probably a little tough to read your bulletin at this point. <laughs> Holy God, we admit we don't fully understand the Christmas story. We are not familiar with angel choruses. We have not walked many miles to be counted in a census. And we don't always hear your voice in our dreams. We don't fully understand this story, so we admit sometimes we hesitate to tell it. Instead of running out into the streets to shout that there is a love bigger than we could imagine, we whisper this good news. Instead of throwing open the doors and inviting people in, we simply leave them unlocked hoping folks will figure it out. 
instead of telling the next generation why this night matters so much, we stay quiet, afraid of creating pressure. Forgive us for our silence. Forgive us for our hesitation. Forgive us for the moments when we fail to share your good news. Plant this story of love so deep in our bones that we cannot help but share it from generation to generation. Amen. We are going to remain standing as we sing our gathering carol tonight, O Come All Ye Faithful. be seated. I invite you to join me now in a spirit and attitude of prayer. Author of our lives, there is something marvelous and wonderful about this night. The glow of the candlelight, the familiar hymns, the kids that are wound tight with joyful energy, the feeling that something we've been waiting for might be within reach. Joy and hope are in the air, so thick we could almost bottle it up. We don't want to bottle up this feeling, though. We want to share it. We want to share the joy of this night with the children of this city, with single parents, with lonely young adults, with our unhoused neighbors, with those spending Christmas in a hospital, with those who are grieving, with people who couldn't make it home for Christmas. We want to share this hope with people who had imagined that this year would be different, that this year they would have what they were looking for. We want to share this night with families who couldn't afford to put much under the tree, and with those who are new to this country, fleeing a life that was unsafe or unwelcoming. We don't want to bottle up the magic of this night. We want to share it. We want to pour out your good news all over this community. We want to sing like Mary sang, until all who are looking for you have found their way home. Help us live like the shepherds who weren't afraid to go and tell the good news. Help us take the words of the angels to heart to not be afraid. Help us be as trusting as Joseph, who chose to believe in the impossible. But more than anything, give us the courage and conviction to tell the story. In a hurting world so desperate for hope, we tell this story. Let us start by using the words your son taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
We'll respond to our prayer time by singing together, What Child Is This? Our Hebrew Bible reading tonight comes from Isaiah 9, verses 2 through 7. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who lived in a land of deep darkness, on them light has shined. You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as people exult when dividing plunder. For the yoke of their burden and the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor you have broken, as on the day of Midian. For all the boots of the tramping warriors and all the garments rolled in blood shall be burned as fuel for the fire. For a child has been born for us, a son given to us. Authority rests upon his shoulders and he is named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His authority shall grow continually and there shall be endless peace for the throne of David and his kingdom. He will establish and uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time onward and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. We are going to sing a carol that reflects that prophetic witness of Isaiah. This will be the last Advent carol we sing this year. Let's join our voices in Lo, How a Rose Air Blooming.
We're going to bring our lights up just a bit, and we have the privilege of hearing from two of our young people this evening. So I'm going to invite Kylie and Rosemary forward. And I want to also tell you that as they're coming forward, right after they sing, I'd like to invite any child or young person who would like to participate tonight in lighting our Advent wreath. As soon as they are done singing, you don't have to be here all the time. If you're visiting with us, if you're back after a while, you are more than welcome. And we have a couple wonderful volunteers who are going to meet you up here and help light the candles of our Advent wreath. So we'll uh, hear first from Kylie and Rosemary. We're going to do a brief Advent um, liturgy, but I would welcome any young people who would like to participate in lighting the candles. Come right on up here and meet uh, Mr. Dan, and we'll be right with you. Over a hundred people from the ages of two to 80 years old were asked to fill in the blank for the statement, my story is. From the voices of different generations, hear their answers. My story is privileged. My story is meant to be given. My story is a wee bit messy with lots of love. My story is hopeful. My story is still unfolding. My story is full of failure. My story is wrong, but good. My story is not just a story. My story is multilingual. Thank you to all of our candle lighters tonight. We're going to join together in singing the story and song, O Little Town of Bethlehem.
Before we read our first scripture, I want to say a few words about the Christmas story. We all recognize that at this point in our spiritual history, the Christmas story is not only a part of our faith tradition. It's also a part of our family traditions, our shopping experiences, our television viewing, and some of our favorite movies. That's okay. We don't need to battle against the many, many ways we experience the story at this time of year. I do want us to remember that when we come together on Christmas Eve, we have an opportunity to tell this story as it was told a very long time ago by several different people in several different places. Even 2,000 years ago, there was more than one version of this special story. Many people recognized the importance of Jesus and they told stories about his birth and about his life. Four of those stories were captured in the Bible and each one of them is unique. Each one tells us different and important truths about Jesus. Now, a lot of times we take snippets from all those stories to make our beautiful Christmas narrative with the memorable characters we love to see in our nativities and our Christmas pageants. But tonight, we're going to hear those stories just as they are, just as they were written down a very long time ago. So we begin with the earliest gospel, the Gospel of Mark. The author of Mark tells this story. The beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in the prophet Isaiah, See, I am sending my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness, proclaiming the baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And people from the whole beginning from and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair, with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed, The one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I am baptized you with water, but he in those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. Now just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the Spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice came from the heavens, You are my Son, the Beloved. With you I am well pleased. And the Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. He was in the wilderness forty days, tempted by Satan. And he was with the wild beasts, and the angels waited for him. Here is the word. Now, I wouldn't blame you if you're feeling a little quizzical and wondering if I picked the wrong passage from the book of Mark. That doesn't sound like a Christmas story at all. There are no shepherds, no wise men from the east, no Mary, no Joseph. Jesus isn't even a baby. We might be tempted to think that Maybe Mark forgot to tell the part where Jesus was born, or maybe he didn't know that part of the story. But I don't think the author of Mark was uninformed or forgetful. He was intentional about starting his story this way. After all, the book does open the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. For Mark, this is exactly how the story should open, because for Mark, Jesus is king. Jesus is powerful, healer, miracle worker, chosen by God to bring about God's reign on earth. Mark doesn't feel the need to deal with Jesus' birth or childhood. What matters is Jesus' leadership, his power, and the way he transforms people's lives. Mark does tell us about John the Baptist, a man who stood out in the countryside and told people Jesus was coming. Now, I don't know about you, but I do not have a single employee or colleague or friend whose job it is to go places ahead of me and announce that I am coming. That is the stuff of kings. And Mark reminds us that Jesus is in every way a king. He deserves a full-time announcer 
to remind us again and again how important he is. In this version of the story, John the Baptist says only a few lines, and they are to point out that Jesus is so powerful that, John says, I'm not even worthy to kneel down and tie his shoes. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Jesus is king. Mark also tells us Jesus went out to the countryside and met John the Baptist. John even baptizes Jesus, and in that moment, the clouds part and the Spirit descends like a dove, and a voice is heard to say, You are my Son, my beloved, with you I am well pleased. Mark wants us to understand that God's blessing and the power of the Holy Spirit rest on the person of Jesus. He is chosen by God to usher in God's leadership on earth. Jesus is King. We are going to sing a royal carol, and I'm going to invite you to stand as you're able for this one. We're going to sing verses 1 and 3 of Hark the Herald Angels Sing. You may be seated. The author of Luke tells this story. In those days, a decree went out from Emperor Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration and was taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria. All went to their own towns to be registered. Joseph also went to the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to the city of David called Bethlehem, because he was descended from the house and family of David. He went to be registered with Mary, to whom he was engaged and who was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for her to deliver her child, and she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in bands of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. In that region, there were shepherds living in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. Then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for see, I am bringing you good news of great joy for all the people. To you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a child wrapped in bands of cloth and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace among those whom he favors. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go now to Bethlehem and see this thing that has taken place, which the Lord has made known to us. So they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the child lying in the manger. When they saw this, they made known what had been told them about this child, 
and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured all these words and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told them. Here ends the reading. Well, that's more like it. When we think Christmas story, this is what we want to hear. We've got angels and shepherds, the stable and the manger, and Jesus is actually a baby. This is the story of which great Christmas pageants are made. But before you go getting all warm and fuzzy, I need to tell you, this story is also scandalous. Just a few moments ago, I was explaining to you that Jesus is king. He's mighty. He's powerful. He's beloved by God, announced by one crying out in the wilderness. Now the author of Luke is telling us a simple story with little of the honor that should be afforded a king. Luke tells us Jesus was from Nazareth, which was a dump, by the way. No respectable leader came from such a small, poor, insignificant city as that. The whole story of Jesus being born is one sentence. She gave birth to her firstborn son, wrapped him in bands of cloth, and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Now, I don't have to tell you that a real king would get a place in the inn, not in a stable, certainly not in a manger. Then the story goes from bad to worse because the first people who hear about Jesus' birth and come to meet him are shepherds. There used to be a show on TV called Dirty Jobs, in which the host, Mike Rao, traveled around and experienced some of the messy jobs that people do to make a living. If they had had the show Dirty Jobs back when this story was written, shepherds would have been featured in the first episode. Those guys worked out in the fields, miles from civilization. Bathing wasn't really up to snuff back then anyway, but they didn't even bother. They lived with sheep, and they smelled like sheep, they are the last people you would even want over for a backyard barbecue. Forget about a reception for somebody important, for a king. But these shepherds are the first recipients of the good news. They are the ones to whom the angels appear and sing. They are the ones who come first to meet Jesus in his manger, in a stable. And that's the end of Luke's birth narrative. There is no bright star hanging in the sky showing the way to Jesus' birthplace. There are no wise men, no visiting kings. That's it. For early readers of Luke's gospel, this must have felt like a scandal. Jesus is from nowhere special, born to nobody special, laid in a profoundly unspecial bed, and visited by the equivalent of vagrants. This is no king. This is someone poor, simple, and unassuming. If Mark wanted us to know that Jesus is king, Luke made sure we also recognize that Jesus is humble. He needs no trumpets, no fanfare, no royal welcome, no fancy visitors, and no gifts. He can abide the simplest, no frills, even sort of trashy surroundings. Jesus can be every man or every woman. Jesus is humble. We are going to sing a humble car a carol right now, verses 1 through 3 of Away in a Manger.
the authors of Matthew tells this story. Now the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph, but before they had lived together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. Her husband Joseph, being a righteous man and unwilling to expose her to public disgrace, planned to dismiss her quietly. But just when he had resolved to do this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from, his, from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Look, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall name him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. When Joseph awoke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took her as his wife, but had no marital relations with her until she had born a son, and he named him Jesus. In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem asking, where is the child who has been born of the Jews? king of the Jews. For we observed his star as its rising and have come to pay homage. When King Herod heard, Herod heard this, he was frightened and all Jerusalem with him. And calling together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They told him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it has been written by the prophet, and you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judea, are by no means least among the rulers of Judea. For from you shall come a ruler who is to shepherd my people, Israel. Then Herod secretly called for the wise men and learned from them the exact time when the star had appeared. Then he sent them to Bethlehem saying, go and search digitally for the child. And when you have found him, Bring me word so that I may also go pay homage. When they heard the king, they set out. And there ahead of them went the star that they had seen at its rising until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. On entering the house, they saw the child was Mary, with Mary, his mother and they knelt down and paid him homage. Then, opening their treasure chest, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left for their own country by another road. Here ends the reading. These stories just keep getting better and better. The author of Matthew infuses as much honor and glitz and fame into his story as Luke left out. This is the kind of narrative we would expect about someone who has come to change the world. First, the author makes sure we've gotten the message that Jesus' birth was a miracle he tells us the story of an immaculate or a miraculous conception, of Joseph's intent to dismiss Mary quietly when he learns that she's pregnant before they're married, and of the angel's visit to Joseph to assure him that this is intended, not the result of any unfaithfulness. Jesus' birth is a miracle. After all, Jesus is Messiah. Then we get to the really good stuff. There's no stable or manger, both of which would be below the dignity of this new baby, there's no real explanation at all of how Jesus was born, and there are certainly no shepherds. Matthew gets straight to the kings. Immediately after his birth, Jesus has drawn the attention of these wise men or magi from the east, who in turn draw the attention of King Herod, the reigning power in Jesus' neighborhood at that time. You see, the author of Matthew wants us to know that Jesus is the one who will unseat the powers of this world 
and save people from all that is wrong and unjust. Before Jesus is even a year old, we see King Herod afraid for his throne and his power. He sees Jesus as a threat. He tries to get those wise men to go after Jesus for him. Matthew tells this story because he wants us to understand right off the bat that Jesus is here to challenge the powers that be, to usher in God's kingdom, to push the mighty off their thrones. Jesus is Messiah, the one who saves. Even these wise kings from afar are willing to travel great distance, bring their best, and bow their knees to this new baby because he is the one who will bring about change. Jesus is Messiah. Let's stand together and sing a carol of salvation, verses 1 through 3 of Joy to the World. be seated. The author of John tells this story. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and without him not one thing came into being. What has come into being in him was life, and the life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify to the light so that all might believe through him. He himself was not the light, but he came to testify to the light, the true light which enlightens everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world came into being through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to what was his own, and his own people did not accept him. But to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave power to become children of God, who were born not of blood or of the will of the flesh or of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and lived among us. And we have seen his glory, the glory as of Father's only Son, full of grace and truth. Here ends the reading. Well, it seems we've come full circle because that doesn't sound much like a Christmas story either. Mark, Luke, and Matthew are synoptic gospels, narrative in style and full of stories. But this gospel is different. Its language is poetic, often beautiful, sometimes hard to understand. And its stories are different, less concrete, more symbolic, telling us important truths about Jesus and about God's kingdom. The Gospel of John sets out to tell a story about Jesus, who is many things and yet no one single thing, who is beyond easy description. This 
Jesus isn't just born in one place at one time. In the beginning was this word, and this word was with God. In fact, this word was God. The author describes Jesus in several other ways. Jesus is light, a light that shines in the darkness, a light that can't be overcome. Jesus is the one who enlightens us, who opens our eyes and our spirits to see more fully. Jesus is present and has always been present, and yet sometimes he can be difficult to recognize. The world doesn't always know him, especially when he appears in the faces of those who are homeless or poor or addicted or troubled or incarcerated or otherwise cast out. Jesus comes again and again, but his own people, the people who should be most excited about him, don't always accept him. But to all who do accept Jesus, all who can recognize him, at least in some way, he gives power to become children of God just as he is. Jesus becomes flesh and lives right among us, and we can see his glory full of grace and truth. Even though it doesn't sound very Christmassy, this story might be the best one we have, at least in some ways. We love the shepherds and the wise men and the baby in the manger and the star overhead. We hear those stories, we retell them, we act them out, we experience them in nativity scenes and Christmas cards year after year, and it's right and it's good that we do. But the danger in stories is that sometimes when we have told them over and over again, we begin to experience them as distant events of the past. Things that just happened a long, long time ago in a certain specific way. This Christmas Eve, I would like to suggest to you that whichever Christmas story you like the best, whichever version or retelling or movie or gospel narrative, or maybe you like them all rolled up into one nativity scene with the shepherds and the kings all ringed around the manger. However you imagine it happened, I promise you that is only part of the story about how Jesus has come and is coming and will continue to come into our world. Every one of these stories has a word of truth for us. Jesus is king. He comes in kingly ways, full of power, enabling us to participate in and experience miracles in our own time. Jesus is humble. He comes in small ways, in small people, whether that means children or just those of us who don't have much power or influence. Jesus is Messiah. He comes to shake things up, to challenge the seats of the powerful, to unsettle us and make us a little nervous when we've gotten too comfortable. And Jesus is so much more. Light, truth, openness, comfort, a door to new understanding, a bridge to forgiveness and reconciliation, a partner in healing, a renewed energy to love. Embrace all the stories. And remember that you are a participant in a story that is still unfolding. Jesus is coming again, and you are the one to receive him. Make a little space in your heart, alongside all the wonderful stories we have told, for the new story that is being written in your life this Christmas season. And tell that story too. Amen. We're going to sing a carol for each of us, Infant Holy, Infant Lowly.
come now to a time of responding to the word that we have heard tonight. And we do that in a lot of ways. Uh, I don't think that we have a specific plan for passing the offering plate tonight. So I will tell you that if you would like to contribute to our Christmas offering, you are welcome to do that in the offering plate that is up front at the conclusion of the service. But I also want to remind you always that giving money is just one of a whole lot of ways that we respond to the presence of the Holy Spirit in our own hearts. So as we listen to our uh, special music tonight, I would just invite you to be attentive to the nudge of the Holy Spirit in your own heart in whatever form that might take. pray with me the prayer of dedication that is printed on the screen. Eternal God, for generations people have gathered together on this holy night because there is something about this story that speaks to the deepest parts of us. You invite us to bundle up this hope, this good news, and pass it on to our children, to our neighbors, to the world around us. We believe our voices can make a difference, just like we believe this story can make a difference. So we will not stay quiet. We will tell this story of a love that makes room for all. We will sing this story of a love that knows our names. We will live this story because love has come again. We believe that words have power, we will not stay quiet, and we dedicate these gifts tonight so that others might hear and experience the story of this great love. Amen. You may be seated. We come now to a time of lighting our Christmas candles. If you did not receive a candle on your way in, I know that there's a box right outside the sanctuary. We want to make sure that everybody has one. Uh, make sure that you are tipping the unlit candle into the lighted candle so that we don't drip wax on each other and help the children and young people around you. And we are going to sing together Silent Night.
important announcement for you before we go tonight, and that is that you are invited to stay home tomorrow morning, to stay warm, to gather with your family, to celebrate your traditions, and we will be back here on New Year's Day, Sunday, January 1st at 11 a.m. to worship together. As you leave this place, may you go knowing that from generation to generation, we have been claimed and loved. From generation to generation, God has been by our side and we are not alone. The God of yesterday and the God of tomorrow knows you by name, loves you and calls you forth, saying, go be the person you are called to be. Love wildly, do justice, and come back soon. May it be so. Amen and Merry Christmas.